Thank you very much for uh, a very warm welcome. And uh, thank you again for me for the very generous uh, introduction, the generous words. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here at uh, King's College and at the Africa Leadership Center. And being here is somewhat uh, nostalgic for me. I was a student at the LSE many years ago. And looking uh, around at the so many young faces here, I'm a bit embarrassed to say how many years ago that was. Uh, but I'm also a professor, and so I'm happy to be in this academic environment, especially after the utter madness of politics. I think that is a very nice, uh, very nice place. So I must thank uh, the management of the Africa Leadership Center for the kind invitation to be here. I think this is a uh, good uh, place to be after uh, the rough and tumble of our politics. King's College London, I think, is also to be commended for its contribution to training so many outstanding uh, leaders in Nigeria over the years. And of course, uh, so many who are here now, uh, uh, Professor Lon Shaki is, of course, one, and so many others who are here. Uh, Professor Kenneth Omukadike, uh, a distinguished historian who was also the first indigenous vice chancellor of Nigeria's first university, the University of Ibadan, is mm -hmm. an alumnus of King's College. We also have uh, Mrs. Koforola Pratt, the founder of the first school of nursing in Nigeria. She also was uh, here at, uh, at King's College and a recipient of the Florence Nightingale uh, award for from the International uh, Red Cross, uh, the International Red Cross. The doctor in our team, in this my team coming from Lagos, uh, Dr. Nicholas Odifren, is here also. He's also an alumnus of King's College, and he never lets us forget about it. Uh, and some of us have had to caution him that uh, to no avail, of course, that. Being here at King's at some point doesn't make you Desmond Tutu. <laughs> I think he has. I also think uh, we should agree, I think we should agree that the African Leadership Center deserves commendation for how it has in a few short years of its, of its establishment gained a stellar reputation for teaching and research and for leadership studies that are focused on the African continent and training a whole new generation of scholars and practitioners on issues of peace, security, and international development. I uh, know that the theme of the King's Africa Week 2023 was, as has been said, changing Africa in a shifting global landscape. So I will tell all my remarks this evening to this broad theme while also seeking to answer the question of how Africa can prosper in this shifting global landscape. I think that a point on which uh, there will be no reasonable dispute is that we live in a complex and somewhat uh, confusing period. The lines have never been more blurred in the various conceptual prisms through which we view the world. The existence of several centers of political, political and economic power since the unipolar world of the 1990s has meant that there are various ways in which global developments are viewed. Of course, in addition to the United States, we now have, we have China, Russia, the European Union, the UK, India, and Brazil as dominant regional powers. The perspectives, decisions, and actions of these actors impact not only on their regions, but across the world including in multilateral forums all across the world. The Russian-Ukrainian war is, if we, if we start with that, you just consider how that has impacted uh, the world and in fact has impacted Africa. Apart from its consequences for international peace and security, that war has signaled a breakdown of the global order, which emerged at the end of the Second World War and is a source of concern to many African countries who now have to steer their way delicately between the major powers. But the more immediate and consequential fallout of the war, as we all know, 
are the sharp hikes in food prices, especially wheat, sunflower, and uh, sunflower oil, and uh, even rice and maize, and then fuel and fertilizer prices. Many African countries, of course, are heavily dependent on one or both of the warring parties for food and oil. So when the conflict began in February last year, the price of wheat increased by 67% from the price in December 2021. Oil prices similarly went through the roof. International prices for oil averaged $100 per barrel in 2022, as compared to about $70 per barrel in 2021. And then also given that key manufacturing uh, countries are oil importers, higher oil prices invariably translated to higher prices for manufactured products as well. So these price shocks and disruption of supply chains of various commodities across Africa led to high inflation at a time when most countries were struggling to overcome the economic and social fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic, especially debt and foreign, uh, foreign currency crisis. The situation was relieved somewhat by the deal that was brokered to enable the export of Ukrainian wheat. Uh, for Nigeria, let me say that despite our strong objection to the invasion of Ukraine, as evidenced by our support for the UN resolution condemning the invasion, we managed to maintain good relationships with both parties. We are now in the process of working out a grain supply from Russia, coordinated by the World Food Programme, and we recently accepted to provide some space, port space, in Port Harcourt, Nigeria, for the distribution of grain from Ukraine to other West African countries. But I think the economic fallout of the war for us in Africa should be an introspective moment, especially on the issue of self-sufficiency in food production. And there's some good news here and there about that. Zimbabwe, for instance, had its highest ever wheat harvest of over 375,000 tons in 2022. And by that increase in production, it achieved self-sufficiency, at least in wheat production, which is a major component of its food. It achieved this feat by increasing land under cultivation, uh, by improving fertilizer distribution, and ensuring irrigation in the winter months, and an active collaboration between government and the private sector. This means that Zimbabwe is insulated from the sharp increases in global wheat prices or indeed further fallouts from the war in Ukraine. What this clearly shows is that by proactive measures, African countries can turn this crisis and others into opportunity. It may also be a moment for even bigger ideas. We may reconsider our approach to food production using climate smart methods that protect and enhance soil health and resilience. There's a lot of work being done by the Climate Action Platform, uh, uh, which uh, clim uh, the Climate Action Platform for Africa, which is an NGO concerned with uh, introducing a different concept. And I might talk about that a little later on, but CAP A, as it's called, you know, has some very interesting ideas on how we could actually turn some of the uh, some of the uh, problems and crises that we've experienced into opportunity, especially uh, in the climate uh, in, in climate action area. But a final word on the Russian Ukraine war. A few days ago, President Lula da Silva of Brazil proposed a peace club, probably led by China. He said he was going to talk to China about uh, this peace club to seek ways of ending uh, the crisis. And I think that that sort of thinking is certainly the way to go. The world must find parties that can be trusted by both sides to intervene. Ultimately, this war, the Russia-Ukraine war, would have to end by negotiations. And I think the earlier that started, the better. Let me then talk a little bit about the climate crisis. I hope it's not my uh, microphone that's making that, that's humming away like that. It's not. Oh, okay, it's a phone. <laughs> All right. So uh, let me talk a little bit about the climate crisis. Uh, the climate crisis is central to current global complexities. 
Just a few days ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, released a report where it cautioned that if speedy action were not taken, global warming might attain the 1.50 degrees centigrade much earlier than expected, even possibly in the 2030s. Now, this is a worrying prospect if we consider that African countries, despite being the lowest emitters of carbon, are the worst hit by its effects and the least capable of quickly responding to or mitigating the damage that may be caused by extreme weather events. At the same time, a competition for increasingly scarce resources, such as water and arable land, is fueling conflict and complicating tensions between communities in many parts of Africa, especially in the northern parts of Africa, in our, in our case in Nigeria, in the northern part, in the central and northern part of Nigeria. We have a lot of what we call the farmer herder crisis, you know, and these are, of course, uh, uh, these are, of course, very deadly conflicts over, you know, uh, arable land and water. But African countries have a little more to worry about, even in the inevitable transition to net zero by 2050, and in our case in Nigeria, by 2060. For us in, in Africa, energy poverty and its implications for extreme poverty are as existential as a, as a climate crisis itself. In 2020, 52% of the population of Sub-Saharan Africa, about 568 million people, had no access to electricity. 19 of the 20 countries with the lowest clean cooking access rates are in Africa. In practical terms, these energy deficits produce staggering defects. For instance, the clean cooking deficits lead to about, to really huge numbers of premature deaths from household air pollution in sub-Saharan Africa, in particular, annually. Of course, gender inequities are exacerbated, and millions of women and children suffer from critical health conditions on account of uh, clean cooking deficits, and of course, the use of heavy pollutants like firewood. Due to the electricity deficits, half of secondary schools and a quarter of health facilities in sub-Saharan Africa have no power and for many gas-rich uh, but energy-poor countries in Africa, such as Nigeria, we are extremely gas-rich. We have huge reserves of gas, but energy-poor. We recognize that the role of natural gas being a much cleaner fossil fuel must play a transition role. It must play as a transition fuel in the short term to facilitate the establishment of base load energy capacity and address clean cooking deficits in the form of uh, LPG. But there has been strong resistance to this. I mean, we believe that bec not just because we are gas rich, but because also because gas is much, much cleaner fossil fuel. We believe that gas must be transition fuel for us. We, and, and the reason why we take this position is because there is no country yet that has been able to develop industrially using just renewable energy. And just for base load, just to get sufficient base load for industry, you absolutely must have some, you know, and, and in our case, gas. But several global North uh, nations have placed restrictions on the use of development funds for gas infrastructure in Africa with uh, ripple effects in the private financial sector. While uh, I, I, think, I think it's just important to explain this a bit, you know. So there are, so the global north, uh, the global northern countries argue that gas projects in Africa should not be funded anymore. And uh, the reason, of course, is that this is seen, I think I know how to do this now. <laughs> okay. The reason, of course, is that this is seen as, uh, in, in some ways, a hindrance or, uh, to uh, net zero by uh, 2050. While some others, the US and others, have created exceptions in their policies, you know, uh, the intended flexibility is not yet clear. So, Clearly, the limit, limiting the development of domestic gas projects, which is a critical energy transition pathway for Africa, in our opinion, of course, violates the principles of equity and justice. 
and, and of course poses challenges for African nations. While in truth making an insignificant uh, dent in global emissions, even if we triple electricity consumption in African countries, aside from South Africa, solely using natural gas, this will just add 0.6% to global emissions. But I've, I, I, and, and really, when, when you look at this, you know, uh, especially in relation to what, what, what can happen to poverty using uh, a gas as transition fuel, and the dramatic changes that that could have on livelihoods and lives in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa in particular, we think that it's only fair to argue that gas and gas projects in Africa ought to continue to be funded by, you know, uh, by the multilaterals and by uh, Europe and, and, US, and the US. But Africa can also lead, in my view, a revolutionary approach to climate change, one that recognizes climate action as the job engine for Africa. James Wangi and his colleagues at Climate Action uh, Platform for Africa have presented this compelling point of view. They argue that instead of pushing the narrative of Africa as a victim and or insisting on business as usual growth, which would make Africa eventually a big future emitter, especially as doubling population and possibly even quintupling of income per capita could propel Africa to the top of the emitter league tables in the coming decades. Africa should instead lead the way in tackling climate change by leveraging on its renewable energy potential, young workforce, uh, green uh, energy, uh, green manufacturing. Uh, in other words, Africa can provide jobs for millions of its young people. It can prosper. It can lead in the fight against climate change by becoming the green or carbon-free civilization. And we have the comparative advantage to do so. I think that this is an. I think that this is an interesting proposition, and I think that just looking at all of the components of it, of course, won't have the time to do so today. Really, does present an alternative pathway for Africa, especially to look at how to tackle climate change, and at the same time address concerns of poverty, address concerns of job creation. But we won't have uh, time to elaborate too much on that today. Let me say a word uh, now about China, Africa, and the West. And of course, you know, there is, and of course, okay. So um, I was talking about China, Africa, uh, the US. Um, in mid-December last year, the US hosted the Africa-US summit only the second of such, uh, the last was in, sometime in 2014. And there was no question at all that the summit was meant to at least register the, uh, to register America's interest in being a more active player in Africa in response to, you know, the evident dominance of the Chinese. China is Africa's largest bilateral trading partner. And China does about $254 billion in trade in Africa in 2021. We did about uh, $254 billion US dollars in trade. China is also the largest provider of foreign direct investment in Africa, supporting hundreds of thousands of African jobs. Now, this is roughly double the level of US foreign direct investment. And China remains by far the largest lender to African countries. Chinese companies have also taken the lead in exploring minerals in Africa, many now in lithium, mining in Mali, in Guinea, in Nigeria, in DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in Zimbabwe, and in, in, in Namibia. Most African countries, as you can imagine, are, in my view, rightly unapologetic about their close ties with China. China also shows up when the rest, when the West uh, will not or is reluctant to show up. And many African countries, of course, have the view that uh, the warnings about the Chinese uh, Trojan loans uh, may be wise, but uh, are probably self-serving. 
Africa needs the loans and the infrastructure, and the Chinese offer them. In any case, the history of loans from Western institutions is not great. The memory of the destructive conditionalities of the Bretton Woods loans are still fresh, and the debris is everywhere. And the preoccupation of Western governments and the media with uh, the so-called China debt trap might well be an overreaction. And I will recommend to you a very eye-opening uh, lecture by Professor Deborah Brotigam about two weeks ago. Uh, she gave the lecture about two weeks ago at the Jesus College, Cambridge. The truth, as she points out, is that all of China's lending to Africa is only 5%. And I think she's, you know, uh, roughly accurate there. Of all the outstanding public and publicly guaranteed debt in low and middle income countries, compared to 23% held by the World Bank and other multilaterals, Chinese lenders account for just 12% of Africa's private and public external debt. And the Chinese, as I've said, have always been there when the debt even cannot be paid. In early 2020, as COVID battered African economies, and of course, uh, economies worldwide, China came together with other G20 members to launch the, the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, the DSSI, as it was called. 73 low-income countries uh, benefited from the suspension of principal and interest payments through the DSSI. Chinese banks provided 63% of the total debt relief, while it only owed 30% of the debt service payments that were due. So by and large, you know, in the arguments about Chinese, uh, how, you know, uh, the Chinese debt trap, as sometimes called, and the large amounts of loans uh, to African countries, et cetera. I think that what is clear is that the Chinese have proved to be, by and large, quite responsible in their approach uh, to the giving of this loan. So, of course, there are always arguments about whether or not uh, you get the very best deal all the time. But the real question for Africa and African governments is who else is offering these loans? Who else is offering the support? So it really isn't a question of here or there. It really is a question of, well, this is what is available. And you know, it seems to me that it makes sense to take uh, what at least is available. Then to the question of insecurity. Uh, there's some restiveness, as many of us would appreciate, in the continent. And this is driven in part by poverty, alienation, environmental degradation, and in many cases, poor governance. The more pressing problem today is the encroachment by uh, franchises of the global uh, terrorist groups in Africa. I think that's a, uh, that what we're seeing today, uh, the Islamic uh, Iswap, for example, Boko Haram, and several of the uh, several of the of the terrorist groups that we find, of course, in many cases, franchises of terror groups, you know, in other parts of the world. Although many African countries, to be fair have acted very vigorously to tackle these terrorist groups. There's still much more that can be done, especially in partnership with the rest of the international community. The Sahel appears to be the worst hit. According to the 2022 uh, Global Terrorism Index, the Sahel has become home to the world's fastest growing and most deadly terrorist groups. And Sub-Saharan Africa accounts for 48% of deaths coming from global terrorism. The Sahel is also said to account for half a million internally displaced persons and 1.8 million people facing food insecurity, 5.1 million people needing humanitarian assistance. So given the scale and uh, the scale of the problem and the threat of terrorism, you know, and my view is that the threat of terrorism anywhere is, is, uh, is, is, is really uh, the threat of terrorism practically everywhere. Because as we've seen, many terrorist groups just simply develop franchises that can operate in other places. So I think it's time for the global community to treat the menace of terrorism, especially in the Sahel, as a common challenge. This is one area where the great powers and emerging powers can put aside their rivalries and work with the ECOWAS and the Africa Union 
on an initiative to stamp out terrorism in Africa, especially in the Sahel. Africa has been, and, and, and I think that, you know, we, we, we need to look at this as quickly as possible. And of course, governments such as ours have made overtures to several, you know, uh, of, of the global powers. And we've spoken, you know, uh, privately and publicly about how to, you know, how to work together to deal with terrorism in the Sahel. Because we strongly believe that um, if it's not dealt with, it could really spiral out of control and uh, give rise to severe problems in many states, that, many states which already have, uh, uh, have problems of uh, institutional weaknesses, law enforcement weaknesses, etc. Africa has and remains a force for global good. And when I say that Africa can, has been a force for global good, I often like to uh, refer to the agreement way back in 1963, when African countries, barely out of colonial rule, agreed to respect colonially inherited boundaries. And this has been largely observed. And I must say that this is a big deal, especially when we recall that most wars in the world in previous centuries were often linked to disagreements about boundaries. And following from, the, from respect for colonially uh, inherited boundaries, Africa has also shown, in my view, outstandingly good example in using its regional integration agreements to promote peace and security on the one hand and trade and industry on the other. African regional organizations have taken responsibility for the maintenance of peace and security on the continent and the sub-regions. I think notable in this regard is the strong resistance that has been, uh, that has been made to unconstitutional changes of government especially at the African Union and also uh, the regional economic groupings. ECOWAS, for instance, has sanctioned countries like Burkina Faso, Guinea and Mali, where soldiers seized political power by coups d'etat. Such sanctions include suspension of memberships, travel bans, freezing of financial credits, amongst other things. And the African Union has backed ECOWAS and, and has also suspended membership of countries that ECHO has sanctioned. It would seem that the sanctions have, have, have had some bite. I mean, I, it, it, I, I, I would not go as far as saying that they have been very effective. They have had some bite, especially to the extent that the affected countries approached ECHO has even recently. They approached the ECHO has leadership at the last AU summit, requesting that the sanctions be lifted. There is a, a good measure of, you know, of, uh, of bites that, they, that the sanctions have had. But I would argue that the measures taken against these countries could have had even greater impact if the rest of the international community had rallied around and reinforced the measures taken by ECOWAS. I must, of course, acknowledge that, of course, the U.S. government issued a statement of specific support for ECOWAS sanctions in Guinea, in particular. And, and, and this, this has helped a great deal. What it is, is that sanctions by African regional groups or by the African Union are only as effective as they are supported by the international community, especially international finance. I think it's important, of course, we all know the interconnectedness of uh, 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 global finance. It is yeah, well nigh impossible for, uh, for the West African, uh, for, for West African states, thank you, for West African states to effectively sanction other West African states. I mean, there are West African states that could simply look to France or look elsewhere for support. So the, inter the, 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 the involvement of the international community, thank you, is important in ensuring the effectiveness of, of sanctions. I think Africa has also, has also shown outstandingly good example through the establishment of the African Continental Free Trade Area. Excuse me. So while some parts of the world were uh, quitting regional integration agreements, etc., African countries were building 
on the Pan-African legacy of leaders like Kwame Nkrumah to establish continent, a continental market. And I think that the uh, AF, uh, AFCTA will overcome the constraints of Africa's small, fragmented markets. And uh, it will have significant impact on commerce within the continent, both in goods and services. And this will be particularly so if adequate attention is paid to building regional value chains within the continent. And, and so I think, you know, just looking at the possibilities for the, uh, for the AFCTA, they're huge. And uh, I'm glad to say that a lot of work is being done today to ensure that the market is as robust as, as it was planned. And one expects that um, the participation of, 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 of African countries, it has almost 100% subscription, will make this truly you know, uh, a, a model a regional um, market. For many of us, uh, w there's a strong conviction also that uh, digitalization offers the best opportunity for leapfrogging for Africa. And of course, as we know, digital technologies are being de deployed across Africa to provide solutions in agriculture, in education, in fintech, in healthcare. Uh, it's also been deployed in logistics and transport. And I think it has the potential to be used also in practically you know, all, uh, all, all aspects of commerce and business. Smart housing solutions, smart power grids, you know, it's, there's just uh, potential everywhere. The story of mobile telephony, for instance, has provided a platform for the use of digital technologies in daily lives in Africa. Due to mobile telephony, Africa is ahead of other parts of the world in terms of fintech and payment solutions. The continent accounts for about half of the world's mobile money accounts. And African countries are using AI-enabled surveillance technologies for facial recognition to monitor and to respond to crime. Perhaps even better known, and I'm sure that many of us are familiar with the use of drones to deliver medicines in Rwanda, and it's, uh, I think there's some effort to do that also in Ghana. Such is the impact that uh, this has had, uh, that, the, 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 that uh, digitization has had, that just since 2016, and despite two recessions in Nigeria, and even a global pandemic, six uh, technology startups have achieved the status of unicorns. In other words, uh, companies that are valued at over a billion US dollars. So there's great potential and, of course, a lot of hard work uh, going on there. Another great resource, uh, which I believe will enable Africa to cope with a rapidly changing world, is our diaspora. And I think that instead of lamenting the brain drain, which uh, admittedly is costly, Africa should organize itself to take advantage of its diaspora, some of whom, of course, are here in this audience. And I'm not about to suggest that you should all ship home or anything like that, you know, because I see a few apprehensive looking uh, faces out, out here. I think that African diaspora, uh, and of course, African diaspora is substantial. I mean, uh, we already see the remittances in the order of 96 billion and so, so on and so forth, in, you know, even just in sub-Saharan Africa. But the African diaspora is a major source of strength. And they have also, in several instances, offered themselves for public service, which is, in my view, is also very important. However, I see the diaspora as our vanguard for keeping up with the rest of the world. Our diaspora is a secret weapon. As we've seen time and time again, members of our diaspora keep a close tab on developments at home. And they often invest their resources in business or setting up facilities uh, with uh, cutting edge services in medicine, in education, in finance. For instance, the contributions of the Ethiopian diaspora that helped to fund the building of the great uh, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is one such major example of diaspora involvement in development. Kenya has also licensed a diaspora investment fund that will enable Kenyans living abroad to invest safely at home. 
the hospital where I had an operation last year, where I had a procedure, is based in Lagos. And the specialists that treated me practice both in Nigeria and the UK. As a matter of fact, uh, just, this, just today I was at uh, one, uh, I was seeing two of the six uh, surgeons who uh, carried out the procedure on me here in, 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 in London. And what, I, what, what is evident is that we can derive benefits from all of our resources, both at home and in diaspora, and it's becoming easier and easier by the day. In my few years of service as Vice President of Nigeria, I've been quite fascinated by the place of academic rigor in both policy formulation and perhaps more importantly in execution. In Nigeria, our social investment program, which is possibly the largest in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, was a product of excellent policy research that has also addressed the problems, that also addressed the problems of how. Because that is always a big problem. How, how, how do you get it done? How do you get it done effectively? And the results um, in, in, in our case, you know, our homegrown school feeding program is an award, uh, has won several awards, where we feed uh, about 9.5 million children daily and created huge opportunities for farmers who sold their produce to the program. Our microcredit program for 2.4 million informal traders was also rigorously evidence-based. The delivery mechanism was also well-researched and the electronic platform, which was developed by a very young team to deliver it, is now called the Growth Platform. It also has won, you know, at least two, three international awards. So I think that there is a lot to be said for serious policy uh, and serious policy papers, uh, serious, especially those that address the hows. Similarly, the insights from the study uh, titled Conflicts in the Sahel Region and the Developmental Consequences, which was undertaken by uh, Fumi here, uh, Professor uh, Oloni Shaki, and her colleagues, helped to inform the thinking and design of our National Livestock Transformation Plan, which is an innovative, sustainable approach to resolving the deadly conflicts around pasture and water between farmers and herders in Nigeria, and one which became a template for addressing similar problems in the Sahel. So our National Tra uh, Livestock Transformation Plan, again, was based on the product of serious research, and you know, especially research that speaks to how to get things done. So I think that there is a lot that can be said for uh, working together with uh, research institutions, with universities, and all of that. I think that that is becoming better appreciated by governments and, uh, and, and uh, government officials determined to, to make a difference in their, in their countries. Let me conclude by saying that Africa can take uh, full advantage of the global complexities we see today and indeed thrive in the face of uncertainties and disruption. The decisive factor will be knowledgeable leadership committed to good governance knowledgeable leadership committed to good governance. Indeed, if you asked me three things that would determine our ability to turn the problems and complexities of our continent around for good, I will say one, knowledgeable leadership committed to good governance, two, knowledgeable leadership committed to good governance, and you can guess three, knowledgeable leadership committed to good governance. Thank you all very much. Thank you.